This week in wrestling history, we go all the way back 31 years ago this week on February 23rd, 1990. WWE presented a live edition of the main event on NBC, headlined by a WWE title match between Hulk Hogan and the Macho King Randy Savage, the rematch from WrestleMania the previous year, and scheduled to be the special guest referee for this match was the then undisputed heavyweight champion of boxing, Iron Mike Tyson. Years before he worked with Cold Stone Steve Austin, Mike Tyson was going to work with Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man until two weeks before the show when he fought James Buster Douglas in a fight in Tokyo, Japan. Tyson was a 42-1 to favorite to win the fight. He didn't. He lost 35 seconds into the 10th round, considered to be one of the most shocking upsets in sports history. So imagine Bruce Pritchard's surprise when he flies home to Houston after getting all the content done early for the syndicated shows that weekend. He walks in the door of his parents' house and his mother says, you got two calls, one from Vince McMahon and the other from some guy named Kevin who keeps calling. That Kevin guy turned out to be Kevin Dunn who told Pritchard that Tyson lost Pritchard wasn't even aware of the fact, I think, that Tyson was fighting or he didn't know the outcome of the fight. So Kevin Dunn said, yeah, Tyson lost. And they had already done voiceovers for the shows, you know, talking about Tyson winning another big fight. So now he's thinking, fuck. He calls Vince. Vince McMahon tells him, hang on, hang on, pal. I'm on the other line with Don King in Tokyo. So he puts Pritchard on hold for about... 20 minutes, comes back on the line. He goes, all right, we need to adjust the voiceovers for the shows. He says, Vince, I, I just got home because I'm in Houston. And Vince says, all right, I'll see you tomorrow in the studio. He goes, but Vince, everybody from the production team, we're all over the country. We're scattered all over the country. We got everything done early and everybody went home. He's like, all right, great. I'll see you all in the studio tomorrow. Ha, 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 ha. That's how I imagine the uh, he sounded in this conversation. But this is the story that Pritchard told on his podcast of, of what Vince McMahon said to him when he uh, got him on the phone, finally. So, they all had to fly back to Stanford, and Tyson backed out of the appearance. So they still might have used him, but I guess he and his team just weren't interested anymore in, in, uh, in doing it. Lucky for them, though, they got Buster Douglas, the man who beat him, to step in and reportedly for a lot less money. The belief is that they were going to be paying Tyson a million dollars, or at least somewhere in the range of a million dollars, to officiate the match. They only paid Douglas a little over a hundred thousand, right? A, a paltry sum. A paltry, I think it was a hundred and ten thousand dollars, supposedly, that they paid him for the appearance. Although I doubt. Douglas and his people knew at that time that they were going to pay Tyson a million and they were <laughs> they were giving them only a fraction of what they were going to pay the other guy. I somehow doubt that they knew that and if they did they probably would have made a stink about it. But there's always been rumors that WWE had planned some kind of big angle with Tyson and Hulk Hogan possibly on that uh, main event show like at the end of the match and possibly even a match. At some point down the road, now I think they had already made the announcement on TV of Hogan and Warrior, so I don't, I don't think that would have been a WrestleMania match in 1990. But there was a lot of chatter at that time that WWE was at least interested or, or conversing with Tyson and his people about the possibility of doing a match, a pay-per-view match at some point, Tyson against Hogan, which they thought would have been a huge, you know, windfall on a pay-per-view and probably would have been back then. I mean, we're talking Tyson in his prime. But would, would it have actually ended up happening? Probably not. Just think about the amount of money that they would have had to have ponied up to get Mike Tyson to step into the ring for a big pay-per-view match against anybody, let alone Hulk Hogan. Uh, the company wasn't doing that good at that time. For the money, they would have had to probably pay this man for that. So I, I don't think there was ever any realistic shot whatsoever uh, of that actually happening. But in the match, Hogan beat Savage because, of course, he did. 
And when Savage confronted Buster Douglas after the match, Douglas threw a punch at Savage that missed by a, a mile. If you watch it back, Savage doesn't even go down. He doesn't really sell it at all because he knew it looked bad. He knew the punch missed. He sort of grabbed Douglas, probably to lean in and tell him, hey, throw another one. And the second one looked a little bit better at least, and Savage sold it, and he went down for the punch. So that was the, uh, the main event in 1990. 28 years ago this week, on February 22nd, 1993, Hulk Hogan returned to WWE television for the first time since WrestleMania 8 and made his Monday Night Raw debut in a promo segment with his new manager, just announced on this show, Jimmy Hart, and his new tag team partner, as he called him, Brutus the Bionic Barber Beefcake. It was the formation of the Mega Maniacs for a match at WrestleMania with Money Incorporated, weeks after Money Inc. had taken a briefcase to Beefcake's previously shattered face. In fact, I think it might have been Beefcake's first match back in the ring since the uh, accident, the parasailing accident that shattered his face uh, about three years, was it uh, three years? Yeah, probably the summer of 1990, I think, is when he had the accident. And, you know, Money Inc. got a lot of heat, heel heat, smashing him in the face with a briefcase, and Beefcake sold it. <laughs> Vince McMahon on commentary and Beefcake in the ring was selling it like his face was just completely reshattered. Jimmy Hart was managing Money, Inc. at the time, and even he thought this whole thing was so heinous, he tried to say, don't do it, don't do it. They shoved him out of the way. So that was the, the Jimmy Hart babyface turn and how he ended up with uh, Hogan pretty much for the rest of Hogan's life. Jimmy Hart is still managing Hulk Hogan in real life to this day. Wherever Hulk Hogan goes, so goes Jimmy Hart. But this was the beginning of their on-air alliance, their on-air partnership together. Uh, also on this show, earlier in the night before Hogan actually came out for his return, they aired a taped in-studio interview with Vince McMahon and Hogan teasing what Hogan might announce when he shows up on Monday Night Raw at the Manhattan Center. Hogan sitting there in his Ico Pro t-shirt talking about there being people who want to dig into your past when you're a big star and find out what you're all about. And when they dug into his past, they found out that Hulk Hogan is a human being. I'm surprised he didn't give this same speech after he got caught on that leaked audio. He said, Hulk Hogan is a human being. And here I thought he was a, a leathery skin mutant from the planet Brother Jack Dude. So it's nice to know that he's human just like the rest of us. He said that he's not afraid to admit that he's made mistakes in his life. Alluding, he didn't outright say it, but he was clearly alluding to the steroid allegations from that period. He said there's also a lot of tabloid terrorism going on. These are the people, he says, that dwell on the negative, dig up any dirt they can, and even if the allegations are false, they report them anyway. Yeah. Take that, Phil Mushnick. He also added a new demandment of Hulkamania. Before it was train, say your prayers, Eat your vitamins. Believe in yourself. And the newest demandment? Believe in Hulk Hogan. Hogan said you hear the expression, do as I say, not as I do. He goes, the new Hulk Hogan, it's all about do as I say and do as I do. He wanted to set an example for the youth of America. But I love that we got a, a brand new demandment. Believe in Hulk Hogan. 27 years ago, on February 22nd, 1994, at the Superstars taping in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The show included a dark segment that did not air on television where Vince McMahon interviewed Jim Cornette, who had Yokozuna's WWF title slung over his shoulder. Looked like Jim Cornette was the WWF champion. And he insulted Lex Luger, one of Yokozuna's opponents at WrestleMania 10. He even said that if Luger were here right now in front of me, I'd slap him right in the face. That brought out Lex Luger. I guess Cornette didn't know Luger was in the building. And out walks Luger, who grabbed the belt out of Cornette's hand. And he asked Vince McMahon, uh, can you strap it around me? He wanted Vince to put that strap on around his waist to see how it looks, which Vince McMahon was more than happy to do. 
You can watch the entire segment, by the way. It is on the network under the title, Lex Luger Envisions Himself with the WWE Championship. I don't know what section. It might be Hidden Gems or something. I don't know. But it is on the network if you want to watch it. I have to admit, that belt did look good around Luger's waist. I mean, that belt looked good anyway. But that belt looked uh, it looked good on him. Vince McMahon, not quite reaching climax yet, suggested that the ring announcer get into the ring and give Luger a proper introduction as the champion to show people what it might be like after WrestleMania. So off to the back went Luger. The ring announcer got in the ring and he introduced Lex Luger as the new World Wrestling Federation champion. And out came Luger to uh, his uh, Stars and Stripes music to a decidedly lukewarm reaction. I mean, it was almost shocking how little reaction this got from the people in the building. Jim Cornette has said the reason they did this whole thing was purely just to throw off the smart fans, which WWE did do from time to time, especially when they ran in the Northeast, as they did on this night. It was just a red herring to make the people in the building. A lot of them probably read the newsletters back then, Torch, The Observer, just to make them think that Luger was going to win at WrestleMania because they, they used to run these marathon tapings. And a lot of the people in the building knew that these shows would not be airing on television for many more weeks. Probably until after WrestleMania. Which was only, I think, a month after this. So, that's why they did it. They did it to throw people off. Throw off the smarts. That's why they did what they did. Look, they had their chance at SummerSlam the year before. If they wanted to put the title on Luger, that was the time to do it. And forevermore, Luger will look like an idiot for winning by countout, not winning the title. And they give him this big celebration with pyro and balloons and fanfare and wrestlers hoisting him on their shoulders. Even as a young fan, I said, what a dope. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. You didn't win the title, you big dummy. <laughs> it made him look so bad. And I think any desire to see him with the championship or any, you know, I don't know, any real support he might have had in that role, it just sort of slowly evaporated after that. And by the time they got to the Royal Rumble, it was very obvious who the fans want, at least in the building that night, who the fans wanted to see walk out with the title. It wasn't Lex Luger. It was Bret Hart. They had their chance, and they blew it. 24 years ago this week, on February 24th, 1997, Monday Night Raw returned to the Manhattan Center for the first time since 1993, where it all began. The show is mostly remembered for two things. The return of the Legion of Doom to the company for the first time since 1992 in a match against the Headbangers that maybe, maybe, should have gone a minute. It went over 10 minutes and they couldn't even beat the Headbangers. They went to a double countout in their first match back. Whoever booked the Road Warriors to return and wrestle a 10-minute match with the Headbangers and not even win, most likely headbang their own head against the wall a few times before they booked this. The other thing this show is remembered for is the ECW invasion. Weeks before ECW ran its very first pay-per-view, barely legal. This was like a free commercial for Paul Heyman and, and ECW. But WWE did it. They were fighting a ratings war, at the uh, a losing war, by the way, against WCW at that time. And also, at, if I remember on that night, half their roster wasn't even there. Half their roster was overseas in Germany on a European tour. So they were very shorthanded that night. There was a horrible main event. A uh, singles match between Farouk and The Undertaker just absolutely sucked. I mean, the actual matches, at least on the WWF side that night, sucked. What I remember about the show was them being back at the Manhattan Center, and I remember Paul Heyman and the ECW stuff, and Heyman on commentary with Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler. Him and Lawler just going at each other. Uh, Lawler hated ECW at that time. Not only on TV. I, you know, He was going off on them on TV. He would call them extremely crappy wrestling. 
it wasn't just a TV gimmick. He really did not like ECW. He did not like Paul Heyman. He had his issues years earlier. He once punched Paul Heyman in the face. So he legitimately did not like ECW, but he was smart enough to understand that, hey, we got some real heat here. So when Lawler eventually showed up at the ECW arena, you can imagine the kind of heat that he got. So it wasn't like he wasn't willing to do business and he wasn't willing to show up there in the, in the lion's den. He did. But his dislike of Paul Heyman and ECW came across as genuine on TV because it was. <laughs> he didn't have to make anything up. He pretty much could just tap into his real feelings. And uh, what you saw really is what you got. But it really did. The, the interplay between them, every time Lawler and Heyman were on TV, it really felt like they genuinely did not like each other. You know, when they had the great debate on Monday Night Raw at the podium, I can remember Heyman making a crack about Lawler, you know, kind of uh, fishing for new girlfriends at the playground, which was, I mean, Lawler has, has dated plenty of younger women in his life, but there was also a, a charge many years ago, I think it was pretty much dropped, but a charge against him from an underage girl that went back to uh, a few years before this. I remember, you know, WWE was not happy about him bringing that up. Lawler probably was not happy about Heyman bringing that up. And I think going forward, whenever Heyman would make appearances, they made it very clear kind of what was and wasn't off limits uh, as far as what he could talk about. But it always made for, for must-see TV. I still look back fondly on those segments. The invasion segment, the great debate... Uh, just the back and forth between them. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, as a fan, it was it was tense and it was a lot of a lot of fun to watch. Sabu appeared on this show. He had a memorable dive off of the giant. There was a like the, these giant letters that spelled out the word "raw" by the entranceway, and Sabu was supposed to dive off the giant letter "r," but he kind of fell. <laughs> I think he lost his balance. So I remember him falling off the R down onto the pile of ECW guys down below. The early days of dives on Monday Night Raw. Ken Shamrock also signed a contract with WWE possibly that same day. He signed the contract, said to be in the three-year range. Made his very first WWE television appearance in the audience that night. No one was more shocked to see him in the audience at Raw than the folks at New Japan Pro Wrestling who thought they had a deal worked out with Shamrock to work a match with Shinya Hashimoto for the IWGP Championship at the Tokyo Dome in April. They were building that entire show around that as this big, huge match for the championship. Probably were going to put the title on Shamrock. Uh, in fact, they held a press conference in Japan five days before this show to announce that very match between Hashimoto and Shamrock, but they did so before Shamrock actually signed the contract that they offered him. Oops. So New Japan officials believe that Shamrock had double-crossed them. Two days later, on February 26th, 1997, WWE taped the March 3rd episode of Monday Night Raw from Berlin, Germany. This was the final show, the one that aired on March 3rd, before Gorilla Monsoon, who was the on-screen president of the WWE at that time. This was the week before he declared that Raw is war for the very first time, and that was when we got the giant Titantron and the stage the following week, which we've basically had a variation of ever since. I mean, if you think about it, the Raw set... Really, the, the basic look of it, with the giant screen in the entranceway, uh, usually with a ramp down to the ring, that basic look has really not changed at all in over 20 years. The biggest change was probably in 2008 or 2009, I guess, when they had the, uh, the LED stage, so they could basically change all the screens to show whatever they want to show. That was probably the, the most dramatic change. The show basically looks the same. It really visually has not changed much since 1997, the first time Gorilla Monsoon declared that Raw is war. WWE had been holding a tournament at that time to crown its very first European champion, and the finals took place on this show between tag team partners Owen Hart and the British Bulldog Davey Boy Smith. They had an excellent match. 
which Bulldog won after reversing a victory roll. Production-wise, as far as the rest of the show, it just did not look good. It was not a good show. It looked terrible. And it scored what at the time was the second lowest Nielsen rating in the history of the show, a 1.9. Only, uh, only one episode, I think, from October of 1996 did worse. Raw would end up getting a complete overhaul, new name, new set, new theme music, introduced just in time for its 200th episode on March 10th. 23 years ago this week, on February 22nd, 1998, WCW presented its Super Brawl 8 pay-per-view from the Cal Palace in San Francisco. Booker T beat Rick Martel to win the WCW television title, but he wasn't supposed to. Martel suffered a very severe knee injury on a, on a hip toss, of all things. You talk about the most simplest of moves, the most uh, freakish of accidents. That's what happened here in this match. If you watch it back, Booker gave him a, a long hip to toss out of the corner, and when Martel went flying across the ring, his leg hit the ring ropes and kind of snapped back a little bit. So his leg didn't you know, snap in two or anything like that, but his leg very harshly snapped back, and instantly he knew that he was hurt, and he was hurt pretty badly. He did manage to finish the match. I mean, they wrestled probably another 10 minutes, so it's not as if the match had to be stopped and he got uh, you know carried from the ring or anything like that but he he knew instantly that uh he was hurt pretty badly wcw used to use those cable uh ropes it wasn't real ring rope like wwe used they used these very hard cables which was better if you were a high-flying guy like all the cruiserweights ray mysterio and juventude and blitzkrieg and la Parca and all these people could do these moves off the ropes and they they had more stability uh, so I guess in that respect, they could be a positive, but in this case, it turned out to be anything but, and uh, Martel, again, hurt himself very badly. He was scheduled to retain the title, though, and not only was he scheduled to retain the title against Booker, but the plan was that they would immediately transition into a second TV title match with Martel defending against Perry Saturn. And so everything had to sort of change on the fly, that whole Booker T. Perry Saturn match, I believe, was pretty much called on the fly. Now, contrary to what some people might think, this was not the end of Rick Martel's career, because I, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, Martel had that horrible injury against Booker in the match at Super Bowl, and that was it. Not the case. Uh, he was out for about five months, but he did come back later that year in the summer. Uh, in fact, it was in July of 1998 he did come back on nitro in a match against the other half of harlem heat against booker's brother stevie ray and again he was injured this time taking a slapjack from stevie which was his basically his variation of a pedigree uh only he kind of elevates the guy into the air and then drops him down face first well in this case the way martel took the move it was more like Head first. Martel was still very skittish. He had just come back. It was his first match back from major knee surgery. It was, I think, basically like reconstructive surgery on one of the ligaments, I think, in his knee. Uh, there might have been a fracture. Again, it was pretty severe. So he was very, uh, he was being very overly cautious not to put too much pressure on the knee, not a lot of hard impact on the knee. If you think about a move like the pedigree or something similar to the pedigree, a lot of guys will land on their knees. And towards the end there, when Triple H was still more active and he was doing the pedigree, it looked absolutely horrible. Even now, occasionally when Triple H will wrestle, I almost wish he just wouldn't do the move. It just looks so fucking just terrible. Whether it's the way he's giving it or the way the person is taking it because, you know, they're trying to protect themselves. I don't, I don't think Kane, for example, I don't think Kane ever took... There are some guys who just never took that move right. And then other people who took it like a champ. I don't know, it made me think of Kane. Kane never took that move. Even in his prime, Kane never took that move good. But uh, he was trying to compensate for the bad knee and not hurt it again. And when Martel came down, he came straight down on his head. And when that happened, he... I think, I think what happened is... He fractured or injured two vertebrae in his neck. 
And that was it. So it wasn't against Booker T. It was against Booker's brother that Rick Martel's career came to an end. And, and again, neither one of them really did anything wrong and they didn't mean anything by what happened. It was just a freak accident. But yeah, you can... It's like if one member of Harlem Heat didn't get the job done, then unfortunately the other one did. Not that that was their intent. But that was it for the career of Rick Martel. As he laid there, as he would say in interviews later on, he, he knew, he was thinking to himself, well, that's it. I, I, <laughs> I'm done here. I'm not going through this again. And uh, that was pretty much the end. In fact, he talked to WWE.com back in 2008. And uh, this is what he said. He said, everything had changed when I got to WCW. I trained really hard before getting back in the ring because I didn't want to come back and look like I didn't belong there. I was happy, but unfortunately, I injured my knee. I knew it was bad the minute it happened. In 25 years, I had not ever had an injury like it, and it was just one of those damn moments. So I trained again, ready to come back to the ring, and trying to protect my knee in a match against Stevie Ray, I injured my neck. At that very moment, I said, that's it. It's over. And it's a damn shame that it ended when it did, because Martel looked great in that comeback uh, before he got hurt. He's probably in his mid-40s, early to mid-40s when he made that comeback. He had been out of wrestling, or at least out of wrestling for a major company, probably since, probably left WWE around 94. So it had been, you know, a good three or four years. And I just remember Martel came back and he was having some really good matches. He became the TV champion. And, and it's a shame because it was almost like he was having this career resurgence for himself. And he got hurt. And then the guy trains and comes back. And in his first match back, he gets another pretty severe injury. So if you're him, you're probably thinking the same thing. I'm too old for this shit. And unfortunately, that's how his career came to an end. Also on this show, Juventud Guerrera lost his mask in a mask against title loss to Chris Jericho. The Outsiders regained the WCW Tag Team titles in a win over the Steiner brothers when Scott Steiner turned heel on his brother and joined the NWO. And Sting beat Hollywood Hogan to regain the vacant WCW World Heavyweight title, vacated after the screwy finish that they had in their Starcade match. And Hogan would have the belt back around his waist two months later anyway. Not by beating Sting. Sting lost the title to Randy Savage. Savage lost the title the next night to Hogan. Because, of course, Hogan always had to beat Savage. Hogan always had to beat Flair. Hogan always had to beat everybody. <laughs> if you think about it. But then again, I guess that's why he's Hulk Hogan. 21 years ago, on the February 28th, 2000 episode of Raw is War, the night that Mae Young gave birth to a hand at Madison Square Garden. A lot of events have taken place in Madison Square Garden over the years. A lot of memorable events, legendary boxing fights, sports games, wrestling matches, WWE events. Tons of memorable moments from MSG. In the year 2000, WWE, I don't know why they decided to punish Madison Square Garden in this way. The month before this at the Royal Rumble, Mae Young made an appearance in the Miss Rumble pageant. And uh, she showed more of herself than I think anybody watching cared to see. That was in Madison Square Garden. That company should have been barred from ever running that building again after what we had to see that night. So they come back to MSG the very next month, and again, it is Mae Young. Now she, at the time, was booked in a romantic storyline with Mark Henry. This was during his sexual chocolate days. He was booked in a romantic storyline with a 77-year-old woman where he somehow got her pregnant or was under the impression that he impregnated her. So not only in, in uh, WWE do most laws not apply, so we've seen plenty of attempted murder on this show, right? The, the laws of the land do not apply to the WWE universe. We, we knew that. But apparently the laws of medicine and science 
and biology, those don't apply in WWE either. On this night, Crash Holly was wrestling Henry in a hardcore match. Mae Young got involved. She came off the ropes and gave a terrible-looking running splash to Crash Holly. Why a pregnant woman would do this, I have no idea. She immediately grabbed her abdomen in agony. She was going into labor, so the EMTs put her on a stretcher. They carted her off to the back. So we, we cut back to a, like two or three more segments of this shit throughout the rest of the night. In the back, she refuses to give birth until someone hands her a cigar. And they find a cigar, and they light it up, and they give it to her, and she's laying there, her, her legs are up, and she's smoking a stogie. One of the EMTs asks her, when was the last time you had your period? She said, 1957. One poor EMT got his head between her legs to try to deliver this baby. Now imagine trying to eat solid food after that and actually keeping it down. Impossible. I hope that guy got ha hazard pay for this show. Somewhere in here, she farted. Everyone in the room gagged. Gerald Briscoe was there. Pat Patterson, Mark Henry. Patterson handed the EMT some kind of metal instrument because they couldn't get the baby out, so they had to use the metal instrument. They had to use the fucking jaws of life to get this child out of this woman's, uh, out of her. <laughs> Try to keep this as anatomically clean as I possibly can, since this will hit YouTube at some point. And finally, this poor EMT pulls this thing out, and it is a giant hand covered in pink slime. Jerry Briscoe starts throwing up, like dry heaving and throwing up legit, because I guess that was kind of a rib on him in a lot of these different segments over the years. They knew he had a weak stomach, and maybe he was hamming it up a little bit, but I don't doubt, I don't doubt that he was probably legitimately sick at what he was uh, seeing, as many of us at home were. Mark Henry is there. He's laughing. I don't think he know, even knows what to make of this. This show did a 6.5 cable rating. You know how many people had to bear witness to what we saw that night? You know how many people that translates to? That's a lot of fucking people watching Monday Night Raw that night. I can't even blame Russo for this. He was already gone for almost five months by this point. Mark Henry told Chris Van Vliet last year, I still pick on Vince every time I see him. Are you ever going to tell me what the deal was with the hand? And he just starts laughing. It's a hand. Welcome to the world of pro wrestling. Everything don't, everything don't make sense, but it's entertaining as hell. I don't know what the plan was. I just go with the flow. I did think why. I'm just curious of all the things. Why a hand? And Vince, he just busts out laughing every time I ask him. It's the biggest ongoing joke. And I think that's what it is. He just did it to entertain himself. Which just proves the point that I've always said when it comes to all the shit that you see on WWE television, the good stuff and all the bad stuff, good, bad, or indifferent, they're playing to an audience of one. And that audience is Vince McMahon. 